Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to this incredible documentary we're going to talk about. What can people expect when they watch it? Uh, they can expect an unpredictable, brilliant, funny, very eccentric person who is way ahead of his time and using art as a way to communicate something um, that we are living through today. And it's quite hard to believe watching it that this was your feature debut. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about the genesis of the project. Um, were you already familiar with, with all of his work um, and what compelled you to want to make th this documentary about him? Yes, yeah, so I was familiar with uh, the name and some of his works. Uh, he's a kind of national treasure in Korea, one of the more famous Korean artists uh, uh, that's known internationally. And uh, But I didn't know more than that. So about five or six years ago, I came across one of his works, uh, TV Buddha, and I wanted to understand the work better. Uh, there, it seemed very layered, complex. It really hit me as something that was made yesterday, perhaps by even a younger artist. And so um, I started researching him and I got into this kind of crazy research hole and uh, ripped whatever I could find online of him. Um, and what I discovered was endless. And it was kind of, I was kind of curious as to why there wasn't a Nam Jin Pick documentary already and uh, embarked on that journey, uh, realizing that this story should be told. And it also felt extremely timely um, because, yeah, there's the still the ideological divisions um, that Nam Jun Pick was experiencing through the Cold War, World War II. And uh, I also felt that uh, where we are technologically was eerily similar to many of the things that he had said, um, that Nam Jun could see the double-edged sword of these new technological developments and that we should constantly be challenging and questioning these advancements and not just taking them for granted. And I think what really struck me is almost like the form of the documentary itself seems to really reflect um, his art or the art form that he kind of created. It's sort of like a dizzying feeling, you know, that we're sort of, that we're going down a rabbit hole and there's just so much complexity and so much texture. Um, but where on earth did you begin uh, trying to compile all these different components and, and put it all together? And, and how do you decide what you're going to include and what you're not going to include? Yeah, it's definitely such a challenge. And, you know, it's always a blessing the more material you find, but it's also can feel like extremely heavy and hard to cut things that you love and decide what you're going to use. So um, compiling the archives took many, many years. The whole project took about five years. And even to the very end, while we were editing, I was still searching for certain archives. Um, and so throughout that whole time, we were looking. And uh, first, I just kind of started with uh, finding whatever I could online. And then what was really beautiful was that Nam June created a network of friends um, around the world and in all different disciplines. He knew so many people, which also made it the challenge, but, and a lot of them are not here today, but at the same time, uh, it was wonderful how one person would lead to the next. So I would, you know, talk to one friend and about a specific party or event or um, moment in Nam Jun's life and then they would be like oh so and so was there or they had a camera maybe they have footage and became kind of these breadcrumbs that I would follow um, and um, in terms of and it was kind of fun you know also even though it's difficult because you meet so many interesting people along the way and also that's how I would decide which subjects I would interview because they were unexpected you know this person who people might not know had such a strong relationship with Nam June was the one that Nam June called when he was scared or, you know. Um, and then in terms of the edit, uh, Taryn Gould, who's a really wonderful editor, um, her and I spent two years um, kind of going through the um, um, archives. And what was really lovely was how both of us really um, resonated with the same material. And I think that really helped because it was very validating. It confirmed the things that we felt strongly were about were similar and we should definitely include those things. And so we could kind of narrow it down that way. Um, and then at one point we did have a four hour version um, and uh, cutting that down is always very, very hard, but you know, you have to do it. So. 
And one of the things that also um, works really well is how you've kind of managed to interweave stuff about, you know, his own personal history and, you know, how he ended up kind of going into the sort of art form that he did, you know, through through different stages and the people that he met, like John Cage, um, you know, rebelling against his father, um, elements like this. And of course, also, you know, sort of the economic and uh, socioeconomic background that, that was happening at the time, um, whether that be, you know, in Korea or whether that be in, in the US and New York. So how, how important do you think it is, is also to provide that kind of like context to understand how someone like him might have ended up creating the art that he did? Yeah, I think that was definitely, that's very astute and I think very true. Like we were trying to do a lot at once in this documentary. And I think um, how to weave those seamlessly, how much time to spend on each of those points, because, you know, to tell the history of the Korean War or World War II, we could spend the entire film doing that. Um, and at one point, you know, we would belabor the point because we're like, oh, people don't understand it. A lot of people don't even know about the Korean War. How can we do that in, you know, a minute or two minutes and without sim oversimplifying it, I mean, and, or to give enough that you can understand Namjoon. And I think the, you know, the context of the history that Namjoon lived through and his personal history were extremely important to understanding his work. And, you know, I kind of see history and the events of the world as almost Namjoon's antagonist. If you think about the story, um, you know, Namjoon, it wasn't like he became extremely famous early and he was combating fame and celebrity or drugs or mental illness or uh, ro like bad romance. It was really like his war against or his fight against like these events in history and the ways in which the world works and to think about that through his work. And so that it really was important that that become a framework that we used so you can better understand Namjoon. Mm -hmm. and the other thing that it seems to really, um, you know, you don't sort of shy away also from some of those contradictions or maybe that's not the right word, like the push and pull, you know, the fact that he was like kind of in this avant-garde um, community of art in, in New York, but at the same time kind of wanting to rebel or reject the art world by by always kind of pushing boundaries. Um, and then when we come to, you know, the way that he used like television, so he's both using that uh, as a medium, but also criticizing, you know, in the way that he was sort of foretelling that we would have to be sort of bombarded with, with screens, which is obviously um, turned out to be very much true. Um, so, so was that also important to you to kind of tease that out, how there was this push and pull with the way that he used these art forms, but also wanted to rebel against the art world? Yeah, I think contradictions is actually the perfect word because uh, he says that he goes, contradictions are good. Uh, and he would say that all the time because they're really, he didn't see the world in binary terms. Um, and he was always inverting your expectation of whatever it was that he was exploring, including technology. And so um, with the good comes the bad and with the bad comes the good. And you can't avoid these. Everything has these sides. And um, and I think Namjoon was always flipping those assumptions, even as a person, not just through his art. So the very beginning of the film, you see like someone's like, he's a genius. And then he like sticks his head in a, you know, a, a cake, uh, like a pile of cream. And, you know, uh, he's like, he studied Hegel and philosophy. And then he like is like pushing the piano over or whatever. And you're like, this guy doesn't seem that smart. And he's always trying to uh, break you out of your idea of what something is so in the same way that cage was like every sound is equally beautiful and then he's like scratching the piano making the worst sound possible that hurts your ears but he's like that's that's also a beautiful sound you know and i think that's that's key to namjoon's work and the way he lived i also love how you sort of um picked out like sort of very clear ways in which he ha did have an impact on pop culture. So even though perhaps when he was first producing a new work, it was maybe dismissed or, you know, there was one critic at some point saying, you know, oh, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, and then when you see like some of the videos, you know, one example being like David Burns music video, like using some of his influences. So um, there's something in that, isn't there, that about, you know, when, when it comes to art, something that, when it's really truly groundbreaking it almost feels like and on first glance it's always going to be rejected but then you can see through time actually his success was kind of um 
he was playing some kind of long game. I don't know, but you know, like you eventually saw his successes come out. Yeah, no, there's also definitely, um, there's a beautiful quote that we didn't get to use um, by this artist, Itzar Pakin. Um, he talks about the TV Buddha being one of the most like memorable experiences of his life, but he also continued saying, you know, there are some artworks that are so powerful that you don't remember ever not having seen it that like uh, image or icon and that I feel like that about even the synthesizer those images like you see with some of the MTV videos that definitely use that similar style and that um, a lot of people attribute to Nam June's work um, it's like you can't remember not having seen it even though yes it was rejected it was very there was a moment when it was being born and that it was too weird and not accepted but I think about that a lot where I'm looking at something and I'm like oh wow like how could the world not have had this before when you see something that's so ubiquitous and wonderful and there's something very inspiring as well even about his attitude I mean that um you know, was it the Good Morning, Mr. Orwell? I can't remember the name, that that TV show that was sort of a bit of a disaster with drunk presenters and sound not working, things like that. But I think his reaction was something like, "Well, it doesn't matter if we have failures here and there. We did it. We achieved it." And there's there's something very great about that that we, you know, maybe in our society now we're always judging things by you know ideas of success are, you know, has, has it been, you know, like whether it's TV shows or, or whether it's, you know, you're on social media. Um, but he's suggesting that actually sometimes art for art's sake, experiment for experiment's sake is also, also has a value. Yeah, no, I think Namjoon is just so inspiring in that way. Um, I think for even for me while making the film to sometimes see like happy accidents like that might be the perfect thing and you see parts of that in the film like there are weird things that happen and I just included it that weren't supposed to happen because it was very Namjoon and I thought he was kind of lurking and testing me and also teaching me things along the way um, and also sometimes if you know you can't you have an idea of this archive that you're going to get or this point that you're going to make and it's not working like just let it go, you know, it's okay. Um, and he would also say, um, if too perfect, God will be angry. That was another quote that I love. <laughs> and in terms of the things that you did find in the archive, um, did you have an absolute favorite um, clip or was the one thing you weren't able to include that you really wish you could have, you know, what, what were some of the highlights, but maybe also some of the bits that, you, you know, you can, couldn't make it into the final cut. Oh, there's so many parts of Nam, yeah, of the archives that I love. There were, um, you know, obviously his artwork. So the Atwood experiments, I'm obsessed with that work. Um, and you see it throughout the film. Um, and I love so many of Nam June's quotes. And when he's talking, like I love when he's tinkering. Um, you see with um, the TV cross and around the moon and the magnet TV. I love those archive moments. Um, and then there's, you know, stuff there's this part that I love that we couldn't include is Namjoon was a bit of a history teacher. He knew so much about history. Um, he read everything. He uh, and he also read the newspaper obsessively in all different from all different countries. And and um, he he's in this class with the Vasalkas, um, and they're just eating bread and hanging out. And he is telling them about a book he read um, and how they decided how they were going to split the uh, split Korea after World War II and how it was a three second decision between the three superpowers. And you never think about how arbitrary those decisions might have been, even though they're still affecting us today and affects like millions and millions and millions of people. But that, you know, it was like a three second decision at a Yalta conference between three guys in a room and how they're going to split up the world because they won the war, you know? And and I love that moment just because Namjoon is, is telling us the history but yeah maybe one day <laughs> that will be in, out in public and um another thread that obviously runs through it which i mean i guess we're sort of mentioning a bit about his personal history um and, and the kind of context but also specifically how do you think it did impact things the fact that he was from korea but you know mostly sort of operating in you know this kind of artistic world in new york and you know that meeting of east and west and perhaps how you can see art as um, a space for dialogue, a space for connection across cultures. Um, and, you know, how might that have been different if he'd been somewhere else in the world, let's say? 
Yeah, I think um, his global experience and the fact that he was extremely nomadic is a big part of his work and also um, inspired him to, um, there's one point where he wrote in his writings that he thought of maybe these new technological innovations that he was using for art as like an electronic Esperanto. So it's this like universal communicator and it can bring people together. And I think he saw these divisions in the world as he was traveling through and, you know, he himself as an Asian man in the West, I'm sure he felt, you know, um, himself as an outsider in many occasions. He never used that as a crutch um, and he never thought of it that way, but he, you know, he definitely saw it, uh, he experienced it. And so I'm sure that influenced the way in which he um, used his art as an ultimate connector. And um, I think if he had stayed in Asia, it could have been different, but who knows? Um, yeah, he's definitely a man of the world. And I think that's really beautiful and inspired me as well. And ultimately, what do you hope people take away from watching the documentary? I mean, it's incredibly immersive. It's a chance to, you know, appreciate his art by the way you've sort of collated it all there. Um, and, and like we said, it's it's very inspirational, just, you know, his worldview and, and the way he just kind of, you know, went from one thing to the next and, um, you know, was so kind of spirit, uh, like liberated in his spirit. I don't know how to to put it. Um, you know, what, what do you ultimately hope people take away? Yeah, I think that's, um, I, I think what's beautiful is that everyone so far who've seen it have come up to me and have taken different things from it. But the one through line is that they feel extremely yeah, inspired by Namjoon, whether it's like they were, they want to restart their creative practice because there's a liberated feeling that comes from Namjoon. They're not restricted by ideas of what art should be or if they are good or not. Um, and that's really beautiful um, that Namjoon kind of inspires people to live outside the box and more freely. Um, and then another thing just that I personally was inspired by was that Namjoon is always asking us to question and to challenge assumptions of, or the status quo and break taboos and um, keep pushing, keep going. Um, and I think that's something with even these new technological advancements that we should be doing is like, you know, you don't have to play a violin like this. Um, the way you're told with a bow, you can drag it on the floor and that you're also playing the violin. And that's the same with these new technological innovations that are coming out to always challenge the ways in which things are presented or used or thought of. And hopefully also, you know, maybe films like this will, I, don't, I guess maybe it's my own ignorance, but, you know, give him the full recognition for, for what he did achieve and his impact on pop culture. And, you know, the fact that there was such a, a new art form back then, maybe people didn't even really realize, um, you know, how much he was kind of ahead of his time. And, you know, can you at some point put that medium, you know, up with Picasso, with Pollock, um, as, as he sort of used it, he sort of said, you know, he wants to play with it in the way they played the paint or whatever. Um, so do you think there'll be kind of full recognition of his impact on, on culture and everything? I hope so. I would love if he became more of a household name because I'm always surprised by how few people know who he is, even in the cultural spaces. Um, and, and that, yeah, more also like more Asian artists are taught in schools. A lot of the curriculum is still just based around the Western canon. So um, I've heard from a lot of um, art students actually who say they've never studied Namjoon. So so that's, I hope that changes for sure. And um, taking up too much time already, but um, just very quickly, you know, obviously this was your feature debut. Do you know what you're gonna be working on next? Um, and what do you think you'll take away from this experience onto your next project? What I'm working on next, um, I'm still mulling through it right now. Um, so I'll get back to you on that. And I want to continue promoting this film and bringing it to the widest audience possible. And um, yeah, I think I want to just take away Namjoon's spirit because it's extremely hard to make a documentary and there's so many obstacles. You don't know what's going to happen, right? It's, it's unfolding as you go. You can't really prepare or control a lot of things. It's, it's about real life and real people. Um, and I think Namjoon's ethos can carry me far um, and the like, you know, you have to let things happen sometimes and mistakes are okay or not even mistakes, just let happenings, chance take over. That's really an essence of documentary. I think that is, I need to keep in mind as someone who likes to control certain things and want things to be a certain way, so. And do you think that's been additionally challenging 
for you specifically for being a female filmmaker, being a female, you know, of, of color filmmaker? Do you think that there are still those barriers and it's still a little bit of a kind of closed circle sometimes of who who's has, you know, access to funding, for example, or, you know, um, you know, finding sort of distribution deals and things like that? I think I was extremely lucky in that I have a lot of uh, female producers on my team and um i um that i definitely don't feel like being a woman has um been an obstacle for me in this case i do think that it is definitely something just in the film world in general that we need to break a lot of those barriers but i do think i was lucky that i was surrounded by people who are very forward thinking in that way. Um, I think it's always hard when it's your first film to get people to um, take you um, seriously. And I think that's the case for anyone. And maybe it's even more so because you're a woman. I It's hard for me to say because I've never been a man. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I imagine it definitely, you know, you people might question you in different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me and I can't wait for everyone else here to be able to see the film. Thanks so much. Thank you. Lovely to chat to you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.